Hello and welcome to another episode of the How to Create VR tutorial series, where you learn by watching other VR, AR, and MR professionals create the magic. I'm Marcelo Lewin, an immersive content evangelist, creator, producer, and the guy behind HowToCreateVR.com. My guest creator today is John Bernhelm, a game industry veteran who fell in love with the Oculus DK2 in 2014 and has been designing VR experiences ever since. I've partnered with John to create a three-part tutorial series on prototyping for VR. In part one, we showed you how to sculpt a character in Oculus Medium. In this tutorial, part two, we'll show you how to export the character from Oculus Medium and import it into Maya. Part three finishes the process by exporting the finalized character from Maya and importing it into and using it in Unreal. But before we get started, I want to remind you to register at howtocreatevr.com. It's free and registration gets you access to video tutorials, practice assets, podcast interviews, ability to favorite, comment, create watch lists, plus much more. It's really quick and easy. Just visit howtocreatevr.com and click on the register for free button. All right, John, welcome to the tutorial series. Glad to be back. I'm glad you're back here. This is going to be exciting. We're going to continue off from our previous tutorial, which was VR prototyping, sculpting a character in Oculus Medium. And you're going to give us an overview of what you did before and what we're going to be doing here now. But before you do that, We've learned a little bit about your background, so people can listen to that previous tutorial to learn more about you and your background, but have a couple of other questions for you. The first one is, what are your favorite VR games today? Some of my favorite VR games are uh, Lone Echo for the Oculus Rift. The way that they implemented zero gravity movement and hands and uh, IK on hands was phenomenal. And then that was a game that by the end of it, the connection you have with the, the main character I thought was really powerful. And the, the ending of that game is phenomenal. And I encourage everybody who's been playing that game, like try to get to the end because it's uh, one of the most powerful VR experiences I've had. No spoilers though. And then uh, most recently though, Astrobot on the PSVR has been incredible and just makes me smile every time. I, I feel like a, a kid on Christmas morning every time I play that game. And um, I want more and more people to play Astrobot because it's probably the most polished VR experience to date. And just every corner of it is just gleaming with joy. Also on PSVR, I really love Wipeout Omega Collection. It's kind of like the way I expected Wipeout to be back in the early 90s. Uh, it's a futuristic racing game, and it does a great job taking an existing franchise and making it VR ready. And um, it's the full game in VR. It's phenomenal. I've heard amazing reviews on Astrobot. It's so good. You know, I'm telling everybody who is thinking about a PSVR or has one, if you uh, celebrate a holiday this holiday season, you owe it to yourself to wake up in the morning and play Astrobot because then you will become a kid again. <laughs> That's cool. I don't have a PSVR, but I've heard good things. So it, it's almost making me buy one. So what would you change about VR if you could today? VR is one of those things where when you show somebody, especially room scale VR, they're blown away. Almost everybody I've ever shown it to is like, this is phenomenal. I didn't realize that the tech was is good but then when they look at the wires and they look at the computer you have to use to buy it they kind of shy away so i'm really excited about the upcoming platforms like oculus quest that are going to be wireless and six degree of freedom uh so you can still give people that same kind of wow factor in a format that is easy to understand and, and to buy and i have to worry about having a 970 or better graphics card and a gaming pc and then also the wires so i, I think that I, I really adoption is the biggest thing i want more people to be doing vr there's a lot of interesting multiplayer stuff but there's not enough people in there i think that the uh, standalone six off headsets increase adoption or at least let that magic be something that can be passed on and people can say cool i understand how this could be a product that'll fit into my life yeah definitely i agree with you 100 percent We're going to get started. Give us a quick recap of what we did in the previous Sculpting a Character in Oculus Medium tutorial, and I'll jump in if I have questions. Okay, so if you remember last time, we created a Goomba from Mario Brothers as a kind of a test NPC in Medium. Um, one of the things I'm going to do here, so here's the FBX that we exported. Windows 10 actually has a 3D viewer built in. If you right-click on it, go to Open With, you should see 3D viewer. And so we can actually use this to check our file after we've exported it. So here you can see our Goomba is looking pretty good. Um, one thing I did that's a little different than um, the tour last time, we, we looked at uh, exporting it at 1% triangle count, and that was a little bit too small for this one. So I went back in and upped it to 3%, and that created this file here. So this is the one you're going to get in the session files for today. So this is a 3% triangle count, which ends up being like 2,500 triangles. So it's still really good for a game character. And you can see it's got a lot more definition. When you lower the triangle count, Thing, details like things like the eyes kind of decrease, but this will be good enough to work with. 
Quick question. You exported with colors. I remember, I think it was Vertex. Yes. So Vertex colors, which this 3D viewer does not show, but we'll be able to use that later on in Unreal. Okay. That's what I was going to ask. So it's the 3D viewer that doesn't show it. Yeah. So basically each vertice in this model has a color field in it that under the hood is still being tracked. It's just that the 3D model of you are using or even Maya or Unreal needs to understand that it needs to look for that color and display that. So I'm sure that there may even be a way to get that working in 3D if you're just not sure. We'll basically hang on to that for later and that'll be one of the last steps when we make our material in Unreal. Perfect. Cool. So we have this FBX file. What I'm using today is Maya LT 2015. The LT series is, is meant for indie developers and it's a little cheaper than the normal Maya. And all these steps are things you can also do in Blender, which is free. Um, you just have to look up the correct Blender tutorial to do this. First, we're going to go to import. I'm going to find my FBX. And I'm just using the, the default FBX um, import settings in Maya. As soon as we hit import, you'll see that our guy pops up here. He's looking good. I'm going to go to the outliner, which will show me all of the different meshes that have come in. And you can see every mesh here is directly equivalent to one of the layers we made in medium. So we had eye whites, brows, teeth, eyes, head. So each one of these is its own shell and it's also its own object here. Quick question on the layers. In medium, you named them the way they are and they transferred correctly here. Yes. But I noticed like eye whites, you put underscore. Is that something that you need to do so it's understandable in Maya? What if you would have called it eye space whites? Would it have transferred properly? It probably would have transferred properly. These days, most things handle spaces just fine. I'm just used to doing underscores because it just removes all doubt and it's more of a thing on my end just to kind of avoid any messy stuff, but it probably would have worked fine. Okay. It's just, you know, why it would be uncertainty. So um, the reason I want to break these things up into groups, besides just having different colors for them make it e easier, is that um, these are kind of logical chunks that can move. Let's look at the, the eyebrows. So when we put an animation skeleton and, and rig this thing, we might want to have the eyebrows move up and down. So you can imagine this being attached to a joint and you can get some basic animation just by moving the eyebrows. Same thing with like the whole head. Once that, that is all rigged up, you know, you'll want to be able to move the head. But what we didn't do is because the teeth and the eyes, sorry, the, the eyes and the feet are kind of uh, together. What we want to do first is we're going to um, separate these meshes. So there's a left eye and a right eye. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to hit control D to duplicate the eyes layer. So I have two eyes layers. I'm going to call one of them I underscore L, the other one I'm going to call it I underscore R. And then uh, you can move things around in the outliner here by clicking on it and holding down with the middle mouse button. My middle mouse is a little sticky, so it takes a while sometimes. Okay, so I have two identical layers of both the eyes. So what I want to do is I'm basically going to delete the right eye from IL and delete the left eye from uh, IR. What I'm going to do is select this one. And I hit Control H to hide it. So now that layer is hidden. Now this is just IL. So I just want this eye. So what I'm going to do here is right click and go to face mode. So I can select faces over here. And, and if you see when you click on a face, it says shell. If you double click, it takes a little bit to get sometimes. Basically click a bunch and it'll, um, it'll select the whole shell. You can also go up to... Let me make sure I'm on a uh, polygons mode here. You can go up to select in the polygon mode menu. And you can do grow selection or convert selection to, yeah, convert selection to shell do the same thing. So if I select one of the faces here, so I have to go to face mode. If I hold on right, right mouse button, this selector pops up and go between object mode and face mode. I can select the face, go up to the select menu and do convert selection to shell. And that should do the same thing as, as, triple clicking on it basically. So that's going to select all these faces that are the right eye. I'm still in the left eye group. I'm just going to delete this. So cool. So left eye is now just the left eye. I'm going to control H to hide that one. I'm going to shift H to unhide that one. So now we're, this is the right eyes group. And we're going to do the same thing over here. We're going to go to face mode, select uh, one of the, the faces. We can go to select, convert selection to show. And hit delete. Okay, so now I'm going to do Shift H on that layer to uh, unhide it. So now we have separate eye layers. 
We do the same thing to the feet. So we want them to move independently. Um, this just makes it easier when we're setting up a real basic um, animation skeleton. So we do the same thing over here. A control D to duplicate it. Let's call this feet R. Use my middle mouse button to move it closer up here just so it's neat and tidy. This is actually called this foot L M foot R. And then you know these uh, names are really just for your organization um, of this mesh. You can also group everything back together later on once we get it. But for me, it's just keep it separate and keep it easy. Okay, so I'm going to hide Control H, hide that one. So we put R. So I want this foot face mode. It's like this. To go to the shell. There we go. Oh, let's see. It takes a lot ago. Okay, we're going to delete the left foot. Hide that one. Unhide the left foot. There we go. Okay, so. Now we have a left foot and a right foot. So now we're, now we're ready to go. And we could have done, you know, we could have split these, these feet up in medium. It's just easier to keep, since they were made with the mirroring tool, it's just easier to kind of keep them the way they are. I'm going to go ahead and save this scene. The scene I'm working on, because it's in my LT, it'll be a different type of file than the so normal Maya uses uh, at Maya ASCII or Maya binary files, which are .ma or .mb. Um, my LT has its own separate type of file, so you can't bring them back and forth. Um, but I'll make sure to include at least FBXs and, and stuff that you can bring into whatever uh, 3D application you're using. So I'm going to call this PC Goomba. It's BLT. First, what I do in order to make it easy to uh, not accidentally uh, click on and select this, this geometry, I'm going to go over to my layers menu here. I'm going to do create empty layer from selected. So I selected all of the geometry, create layer from selected. And this will create a layer. We're going to go ahead and just name that layer Geo. The cool thing that this lets us do is we can easily make that layer visible and visible by clicking on the little V, or um, we can change it from different modes. So right now, so if I hit it, click this and turn into T mode, I can't select the geometry here. So this is great when I start putting in the joints for the skeleton, because I really don't want to move the geometry when we move the skeleton. And then there's also R mode, which is the same thing. I can't select, but it still exists there. So this just basically helps me to, to filter what I want to select. I'm going to change my view up here to animation. And I have the animation tab open here. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to create a skeleton by adding joints. So there's this, this joint tool. We're going to do just a basic game character skeleton here starting with a root bone and then going up to kind of this pelvis area uh, that's going to offshoot to his legs. And then we're going to have go up to the head and then offshoot to the eyes and the eyebrows. So it's going to be really, it's like six joints. It's going to be really basic, but uh, it'll give us enough stuff to connect the geometry to to start to animate this guy so he can be a game character. First thing I want to do here is I'm going to go to this um, front view. So if you look under the skeleton menu, you see this joint tool. I want to make sure that the joint tool does not have symmetry on. Later, we're going to turn it on, but for now, I want symmetry to be off. should be able to just click on the joint tool and then click place the joint. I actually made two joints here. I'll just do one of them. Okay, so quick thing is I notice I can't really see my joint. It's at the bottom of this guy here, but I can't see it through here. What I should do is change the view here. If you go to shading, you can do x-ray joints. And that way, the joint will always appear through um, the character. So you can see it through the character. And I should have done that earlier. So later on, when we make like the joints of the feet, we'll want them to symmetry to be on, because it'll let me create two joints that are mirrored about this x-axis. That way, I can just move one of the joints, and the other one will basically go to this, the right position on the other foot. So it's like the mirroring in... Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It basically automatically creates two joints that are connected via constraints. So you can move one of them, the other one will follow. Got it. So that's really helpful. But when you're just making like the spine, which is basically just going to go straight up a chain of joints, we don't need that. So let's do something else real quick here just to make it a little easier. So I'm going to go to my layer here, which I've turned off. So it's all like a second. It's like these guys from here. I'm going to select all of my geo. and I'm going to move it up. So he's just basically on top of the grid. So it's kind of like he's sitting on top of the grid. 
if I go to the, the quad view, it's easy to, to see here. I can just kind of like, it doesn't have to be perfect. Just basically imagine that's our ground plane. I think that'll make it a little easier. Okay, cool. So this joint is going to be our root joint. And the root joint is basically, if it moves in the game, we're going to set it, it its um, Y value to zero. So it's right on that plane there. Uh, if the root joint is basically what the game uses to put the um, like collision capsule for the character, and it, if it moves, the, the character moves. So it's kind of like your, you know, it's your basic basic joint that the game is moving around. So you always want that kind of to be at the beginning, like right underneath the character. We can animate the character, kind of jump in front of it, be behind it, but the root joint is very important. It should just be right in the middle in front of everything. And everything we do is going to be built underneath this root joint. Okay, so got the root joint. Let's go ahead and quickly make... I have to select it again. When I, when I click the joint tool, you select the root joint again, and then I can click to make a new joint. So you can see how there's the root, and then there's this other joint here. So that's going to be what our stem is, is based on. And then I'm going to go back to this front view. I think in this view, I also have to do the show um, or the shading x-ray joints. So cool. Now we can see the joints here. So I click my joint tool, click that joint. I'm going to do another one that's going to be the head. It's basically going to be in the middle of the head. And we can go back and move these around. I'm just kind of like laying them out right now. Okay, we see here we have root joint. I'm going to call this one stem. Uh, we'll call this one head. And then the, the goal is, you know, anything that's supposed to move with that thing it should be underneath. So when the stem moves, the whole head is going to move. When the head moves, the eyes and the eyebrows should move. So the lower joints can move separately, the upper joints move all the others below it. Correct. And you can turn that off in Maya. If you need to, like, move a joint without moving the other stuff. And it's something, I forget what that is. But basically, the default behavior is that it will um, inherit, the children will, will inherit the transform. But I think that in, when you're using the move and rotate tool, you can also turn that off. So that can be helpful. Like if we we're going to move the, if we wanted to move the, the stem, for instance, and not have the feet follow, then we might want to do that. But for now, let's, you just do it kind of logically. Imagine, you know, it's kind of like when you're doing the, you know, the head bones connected to the neck bone song or whatever. Just kind of think of what things are connected to what and make sure that things on the extremities are connected out as a chain. So the head is connected to the stem, which is connected to the root. We're also going to now do the, um, the feet. And for the feet, what we want to do is we do want to go up to um, the joint tool settings. So you click the little box next to the joint tool. And this time we're going to turn symmetry on. We want it symmetrical about, actually I think it's about, I think we want it to be on the z-axis. Because z, z here is forward. I think that's fine. My other character came in fine this way, so hopefully this will work. But um, so z is, uh, is forward facing direction, and we want it to, to mirror on that, on that axis. So let's see if this will work. Set that in the joint tool. And select the stem. Definitely did the wrong axis. So you can see here, it did create two joints. Create joint one and joint two. And you can see that they're, they're here, but they're mirrored on the wrong axis. Right, it should be on the X, right? It should be on the X, yeah. Right. So, so I'm just going to Z, Z, Z to uh, the back up here, undo. And then we'll go back to joint tool settings. Do it on the X axis. Joint tool, click stem. Click over by the foot, and boom. Now you see we have two joints near the feet. So now we can kind of position those in the middle of the feet. And then again, for this character, think about these joints as being where uh, the pivot for that, that object is going to be. If you rotate the joint, you're going to rotate the foot. So we kind of want it to be kind of near the connection point between the feet and the body. And that's probably good. It doesn't have to be perfect. Zero that out. So the root is at zero, zero, zero of this whole thing. That helps. 
the pelvis is going to be here. And what's the shortcut key used to go into the four view? There's probably a key just to go to this panel layout, but I'm basically clicking over here. Got it. If you have your mouse over one of these four views, you hit spacebar, and it'll make that. It'll maximize big. it, yeah. Yeah, and then you hit spacebar again, and you pop out. So Got a lot it. of what I tend to do, and again, there's, there's probably some shortcuts that I'm missing here, but I tend to go between this four view a lot, and then um, this view over here, which shows the, basically shows your scene graph. So that can be really easy to, for naming things and selecting different things here. And then if you want to have the different views, this is very helpful because you can quickly go from the different views. A lot of stuff you can do, if you need precision in a certain axis, then you do the top down or the, the side views. A lot can be done orthographic 3D view. Okay, cool. So we got some joints. This is going to be a foot R. Point two, foot L, and you can see that I'd automatically created this thing called a symmetry constraint. We can delete that in a little bit, and uh, actually we can probably just go ahead and delete it now. Right now, if you grab foot R and move it, you'll see it's automatically going to move foot L. But now that we have them in position with the BN, we don't need that to happen because we're going to want... Because you want it to move separately. It's, it's only done to create it, not to actually animate it later. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, and there may be a way to, to disable that. Okay, so the head, I want to make the, I'm going to go back to the like, tumble view and put the head a bit more in the center of this guy's kind of head mass. Because again, it'll, it'll rotate the whole head when we, we do this. And then we're going to create joints for the eyes. We already have, um, the joint tool already has mirroring on. So that's great. So if you just click the joint tool and you haven't selected a joint, it'll place it out in the middle of nowhere. And then in your graph, it'll be, these joints will be out here. If you end up doing that, it's not that big a deal because you can uh, hold on shift. I select both of these guys and then I use my uh, middle mouse button and I can drag it into the hierarchy. So you can see there's no connector between those eye joints and the, the head right now. If I put them underneath the head and you'll see they, they get connected. So that's the way to do it. And generally, the joint tool works. If you, click, if you click the joint tool, click an existing joint, then click somewhere else, it'll go ahead and build the joint in that nest, in that, in that part of the hierarchy. But you can also just do it outside of the move it in like I just did. Um, so cool. Here we have some eye joints. Now, these are probably the most tricky thing for this particular um, project. What we want to do here, because we eventually want our guy to be able to look at us, imagine that there's kind of a, an eyeball sphere that these um, uh, pupils are moving around, we want to kind of place the joint in a place where we think that that sphere would kind of exist so that these um, uh, pupils can rotate and rotate around that sphere. Because we're basically going to do a, a look at in Unreal where these pupils are going to be able to look at the player camera. So I'm basically trying to position these things. In this view, it's just going to be right in the middle. And then on the side view, I need it to be pulled back a little bit. Imagine a connection between this, this joint and this um, pupil, and that it's all going to be kind of rotating around here. So you can not be perfect. If you're you know, doing a really a pretty game character, you probably do uh, spend more time on this and get it right. But I think we just need to, <laughs> no pun intended, we need to eyeball it <laughs> and um, just uh, you know, kind of set it up so we're in the best shape for success. We have one more joint we need to do, and that is just for the eyebrows. And that's just going to be a single joint. So I'm going to go back to my... Joint tool properties, turn off symmetry, and I can make a new joint. Click joint tool. This is going to be based on the head, too, so I'm going to click on the head. I'm going to click up here for the eyebrows. And then this is just going to be a simple controller for the eyebrows. So in this view, you can see I still I don't have that joint x-ray. So I'm going to turn that on so I can see this view better. Select this joint. Move it. So... I just hit W to get the move tool, which is over here. And I'm going to move this kind of right at the base of the eyebrows. So that's going to let us raise and lower the eyebrows and maybe scale them to add some comedic effects here. So we've got our skeleton. Let's just go ahead and make sure we I'm going to save. And um, I'm going to go to the outliner and name these joints. So we've got a head joint. Uh, this is left eye joint. So we do I underscore or sorry, right, or is the right one, IR. This is IL. And then this is Browse. 
Now for a complicated, I'm going to delete this symmetry constraint. Cool. So this is our skeleton. Okay, so we have our skeleton ready. So the next thing we need to do is we need to connect these geometry pieces to these joints. Now, one of the reasons I set it up this way is so we can do what's called rigid binding or hard binding. So basically what we're going to do is each of these pieces of, of geometry are going to be hooked up to one joint, and then that joint is going to run that whole piece of geometry. So that'll make it really easy to animate. It'll uh, make it really easy to skin. What you might do if you wanted to make like the mouth move, the mouth would need to have a bunch of joints in here, and different parts of the mouth would be affected differently by different joints. So what we're going to do is have the whole head connected to this one center head joint. So let's go ahead and start doing that. So that nothing's always skinned to the root. The stem. Basically, hold down control and select the stem geometry as well as the stem joint. And then I can go up to the skin menu. There's an option called smooth bind. Now I'm going to show you the options I have for here. So if I click on the smooth bind options, you'll see here it says bind method closest distance. The main thing here is max influences one. This basically says, hey, go ahead and attach the geometry to this joint, but all the vertices can only be influenced by one joint, which is what we want. We want all of them to be connected to this one joint. So we'll leave that at max influences one, do bind skin, and then what you'll see here, if I move the stem joint, then the geometry follows it. That's exactly what we want. It does mean that I can't now move the stem geometry piece by itself. I can move, you know, the foot because it's not skinned yet. I can't move the stem. In order to move that, I have to move the joint, which we want because that's good for animation. Okay, we do the same thing here. We're going to select the head joint, select the head geo piece. We can similarly really have our settings. We can just go here and click smooth bind. Make sure that works and click on the head. Cool, that's working. And then you notice now if I click on the stem and move that, it'll move both the stem and the head. So great. Keep going in this direction. IR, select IR, IR, smooth bind, select IL, IL, smooth bind. Let's go ahead and test those out. See, there's the moving the I joint, IR, moving I left. And then here's where we can also test out the kind of rotation. So if I, I'm going using the rotate tool, I think E key. You know, you can see if I rotate that joint, you'll be able to see this pupil moving around. So in Unreal, what we're going to do is basically have this up, down, left, right rotation impact the pupil, and that will make it look like the eyes are following us. Let's see here, so we did the eyes, brows, connect the brows, select both of those, go to smooth bind, test it. Er, get a little groucher marks thing going on here. It's like foot R, foot R, smooth bind, and do the same thing for foot L, foot L, smooth bind. I'm going to save my project. Okay, so foot, cool, foot, cool. And then you notice here, now if I grab, if I grab the root, you'll see that the whole character moves. Oh, so no, it didn't because I forgot a couple things. So I forgot the eye whites and the teeth. So it's good that we, we tested that. And now these all are going to be bound to the, the head as well. So I can just like eye whites and teeth. They're all going to be bound to the head. They don't have their own joints because we're not animating them. Now I've done that. So if I grab root, move it, everything should move. So the key, anything you want to animate, you want to add joints to? The animation is just on the skeleton, just on the joints. And then you have to basically register or bind each of the vertices in the geometry model to a joint. Right. And that's what the smooth bind does. So basically saying, hey, everything in this, this head, all of these vertices are bound to this joint. So when we move the head joint, that it moves all of those. And then because the head joint has the eye and the brow joints attached to it, anything attached to those joints move with it. Now we're set up. We are ready to animate. First thing down here, there's this little key down here. This is the auto keyframe toggle. This means that if you move uh, or rotate anything, it will automatically create a keyframe 
for that rotation, which is helpful. You can turn this off if you want to avoid accidentally moving something, but in general, I leave this on. I selected all of my joints, and I'm over here, and this is the, the timeline. So this is basically showing us the timeline of animation. We haven't done any animation yet. I'm going to go ahead and make a keyframe. I'm going to hit S, which creates keyframe. You can tell there's a keyframe because there's the red line. I'm basically making that for every one of my joints here. This helps me give a good baseline. This is kind of the bind to pose is what it's called. So it's like the pose everything was in when it was bound. But this just gives me a good baseline. So we're going to make an idle animation. I'm going to make a 60 frame idle animation. So I'm going to go ahead and do 60 here. And I, I want it to start in this pose. And I want it to end in this pose. So I'm going to go to this 60 and hit S. There we go, S. Uh, and then I'll put a keyframe here. So basically, it lets us do things like in the middle here. So I'm just going to do a real basic idle animation. All you really want the idle animation to do is just to give a little bit of life to the character while he's just standing there. So I have him kind of rise up and kind of feel like he's breathing a little bit. So he's going to move up a little bit. So I grab the stem, move the stem up a little bit. So you can kind of see now that this character, if I hit play, you'll see he's kind of, he moves up and down. But of course, his feet are kind of planted, so that looks dumb. So we're going to select both the, the feet and rotate those down. So at the frame 30, kind of looks like he's rising up on his feet. See, so real basic, just giving some life to the character. You know, we can do something like as he rises up, the head might tilt down a little bit. Everything's kind of almost like a little breathing cycle here. And then let's maybe make his eyebrows a little bit. Can you change the interpolation type in between the frames to be like ease in or ease out? Or You can do all of that within the tools. Just trying to make these little basic animations just so we know they even work and that they kind of give a sense of this character. There, that's like, a, that's our idle loop. And it's real basic, but that'll, that'll do what we need. Maybe he's raising up a little bit too much, so lower that down a little bit now that I've added some stuff to it. He's there, he's just kind of chilling out. What I'm going to do is do all of the animation in one file here. So I'm increasing the number of frames we have, and that's basically what we're going to do is we're going to put all the animation on the one timeline. You could also save the file out and do it in multiple files if you wanted to, uh, but for the, this tutorial, we're going to keep it all in one. So here, we're going to say that from 1 to 60, that's our idle loop. And then notice how we return back to this base pose. That's great, because what we're going to do then is we're going to do a, a, a short walk cycle. Another keyframe here. So now from 60 to 120 is what I'm going to be playing with. In order to make sure you don't accidentally mess up the animation frames you've already done, you can set the, the timeline to start from 60 and go to 120. So now we're kind of just playing in this space. So um, we're going to do a real basic kind of walk cycle here. Let's go ahead and let's do work on his feet first. So he starts here. So this is kind of a crossover. And then he'll have, have one foot. Now what I'm doing is I'm basically uh, working on the key poses that he wants, I want him to hit. So I'm going to have him kind of like swing his feet around, around and back. And so... You know, this is like his feet are crossing over each other. And then this will be his um, left foot is going to be kind of up. This is going to be one pose. And then what happens in a walk cycle is it's going to basically come back to this crossover pose. So let me go ahead and you can you hold down shift. So I've got all of the, all the, the keys selected here. I can hold down shift and click. And that will highlight the timeline. And basically, this is kind of selecting all the keys for these joints. So I can right-click, do copy, and then I can come over here. So it is 60 to 80. So let's just go from 80 to 100. I'm going to shift-click again, and then I can do paste. Now, you can't use just Control-C, Control-V here. You have to use this right-click menu in order to paste these keyframes. So you see, so now we have going from this pose to um, out to back again. And then let's go another, another 20. And, um, and we'll, we'll change the timing of this uh, later. And this one we're going to let's go ahead and do 140. Give me some more room here. I'm going to go ahead and select all these keys. I'm going to move it 
when you select all the keys with holding shift and highlighting this, you get these little arrows down here. And you can actually use that to slide the keys around. Okay, so we're, we're back to normal here. And then I want to, uh, 120, let me go ahead and paste the keys again. So cool. So we have, we have uh, left foot out, come back to middle, and here is going to be right foot out. Rotate this foot, extend it out a little bit. Left foot, we're going to do the thing where you swing it kind of back and out. And these guys, you know, these guys are funky. They walk, they walk weird. So a little weird with these guys because he has little stubby legs. But that's a cool pose. Like that looks, you know, like a yoga walking. And we'll see how that how that plays here. So the, the timing is not amazing, but you can see he's he's walking. That was in those three poses. That's literally the crossover pose, left foot out, crossover pose, right foot out. And you want to make it so it's loopable. Yeah. The easiest way to do that is you just make sure that your starting frame and your ending frame are the same. So you can see that that is the case here. The other thing is you can always speed up your animation in Unreal uh, by just adding a multiplayer. So if it's not running as fast as you'd want, it's fine. We're actually going to mess with that on the next tutorial. The last thing I do want to do is I want to give him a little bit of bounce here. So as your one foot is down and you're extending the other foot, you will rise up a little bit. So we're just going to grab the head and make him rise up. So he kind of goes up. This should be the whole, the whole stem here. Rise up a little bit. So you have this rise, fall, and we're going to do a rise again. So that's actually not too bad. That'll. It's pretty cool, actually, yeah. Yeah, so it's real easy to do a very basic walk cycle. The two things to think about are, again, that foot crossing. So cross, one foot out, cross, another foot out, and then the rise and fall. I highly recommend, if you're interested in animation at all, there's a book called the, um, the Animation Toolkit. Uh, that's a classic, classic book that's really good at describing a lot of the stuff in classic 2D animation terms. Okay, so we got our, our idle, we got our walk cycle. Go ahead and give us some more frames here. We can go up to 200. Let me move this frame, which wouldn't let, for some reason wouldn't let me move it to 140. Should let us do it now. There we go, just so we have an even, even timing. Uh, and again, we're, we're starting here from the end. We're actually rock and rolling. We have a couple more animations to do. Okay, so we have our idle and we have our walk animation. Now it's time to do a couple more gameplay animations. So one of the things in my game uh, that I can do is, just like with Mario, you can jump on top of an enemy and squash them. So that's an easy, easy one to do. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to start at 140 here. This animation only needs to be about 30 frames. So we we'll go to 140 to 170. And I have my kind of base pose all selected. Paste. That'll paste the keyframe for all the joints over here. So now I have this time to work with. Basically, uh, what I want to do is I'm going to scale things down so that it's like you jumped on this character and he got squashed. So and that should happen pretty quickly. So I'm going to maybe only go four frames in. I'm going to go ahead and grab the stem here. I can go into the channel box, the attribute editor here. I have to look at how this works. But basically, it won't let me scale. Uh, I can scale things uniformly, uh, but I can't scale it on one axis from the tool. I think there's probably something in the tool setting. But for now, I'm just going to go ahead and do that in, in the attribute editor. So. I can scale this down. So yeah, I'm gonna grab the head. I'm basically going to scale this down to 1.25. You can see it's kind of this squash kind of thing happening here. I'm gonna rotate this and drag it down. Whoa. You can get some funky stuff by, uh, <laughs> as you can actually, see. Actually, that one's pretty cool. By changing scale. That's actually pretty cool. So we're just gonna go with that. So scaling on Z. And then what we're going to do is we're basically going to say, cool, that looked kind of like a flat guy. Let's rotate it as if you squashed him down like this, right? We're going to cut that and place that on 140 so that happens really quickly. All right, so in just a few frames, he's going to go from up here to squash. So it looks like that. In the game, that'll actually read pretty funny. I think we're just going to go with it. Might change these eyes. So have them be set in a little better way, but again, this is stuff you can noodle on forever, and we just want kind of a funny squash effect. So he goes like this, and wow, squash, and then he stays here, so you'll be able to see that. 
Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to select all of these keys, copy them. The way the squash works is he squashes quickly, and then we'll stay in the squash pose for a while, frame 160, and then that way he kind of sticks around. And in my game, characters can squash, they stick around for a few frames, and then they disappear. So I want him to just kind of stay there. So he's going to, and maybe we actually want to move this over to 170, give him some more time to squash. So this is how it'll look. So real quick squash, and then he's kind of stuck there. Okay, so we got idle, we got move, we got squash. Let's do a hit react real quick. Give myself go to 190. Hit reactions, let's do 195. And this will be 170. So for 170, it's 195. We're going to do hit reaction. Uh, actually, we're going to do 171. There's 170. So this is, we want him to go back to his... I want to go back to my very first frame, and then we're going to grab that pose, that kind of default idle pose here. There's a way to do it through telling him to go to the bind pose I was trying to do a second ago, but it did not work. This will work fine. So I grabbed all my frames, so right click, do copy, and I go back to 171. That's where we're going to start this new animation. And he was in squash pose. We don't want that, so we're going to shift click and do paste. Now he's back to his default. Cool. And then we're going to go from 171 to 195. Let's paste it down here, too, just to make sure we have it. Now, hit reacts. This is when the enemy gets attacked. Uh, and this is really important to show off basically the strength of the character's attack. Uh, so what we're going to do is very quickly, let me only have three or four frames in, we're going to snap this character back into a pose of getting hit. So we're going to push him back a little bit with the stem. In fact, we can just rotate the whole stem, too, to kind of give him this, whoa, I just got punched. His legs are going to follow behind, so we're going to rotate those down. So imagine, so, this, so what we're trying to do here is get him into a pose that looks, looks ouch, looks like he got, got hurt. Um, we'll rotate his head back even further. This is where we can do some funny stuff with the eyebrows. So imagine the eyebrows move up, and imagine that they get big, so I'm scale them up. So you can do some fun, like, cartoony stuff here. He's like, whoa, I just got punched in the face real hard. So he kind of is going to go like this, and then he's going to recover and come back. So this is a real, real basic hit reaction. But you can see that snap, that feel like, oh, man, you know, imagine that. You know, so in my game, you have these uh, long, uh, uh, these punching gloves on, on long spring arms. And so you can punch characters. This is like a, a way to do that. Um, might as well just make his, his eyes, uh, eyes get big too. Like, whoa, boom, I just got, he just got wrecked. Can't change the eye whites because they're just part of the head. But uh, let's just see how that, that feels. Whoa. So I'm just kind of reading a little bit more, more pain in there. Some games will actually start the hit reaction animation at the, the hit pose here. If you do that, then your game will basically, you'll have it blend into this real strong pose. That's not a bad idea. So you could just go ahead and say, instead of this being four frames in, we can actually move it even quicker in, but I just want to kind of show you what that, that, that feels like. So yeah, we have this hit reaction. This is going to happen when you punch the enemy. And then we have one more animation to do, and that's when they attack you. So I'm going to go ahead and start at 195. We're going to go to 220. Attack animations are also important and fun to do. They are three parts. The attack animation is, uh, so you kind of start at your base pose. You're going to have an anticipation pose, which is basically like what happens in the wind-up to the attack. Now, this guy's just going to do kind of a headbutt. So the wind-up to his attack is going to be, he's going to kind of rear back and kind of get ready to attack you. It should look different than the, um, the hit react. Let's see, I want him to kind of raise up. Like he's kind of jumping back and he's going to headbutt you. So we want this to feel like a powerful, strong thing he's doing on purpose. He's going to kind of have his feet down like he hopped up and have his head kind of up and out. So he's kind of going to go, ah, uh, wham, and then slam into you. Let's go ahead and give him like as much stretch as we can on this thing. Basically trying to give him a feeling that he is really moving his little, his little body and uh, maybe he's jumping up in the air, so we can uh, raise him up in the air. You can see the root is still attached here, which is fine. So he's kind of going to go up, go up, and then he's going to do a, the hit. So the first pose in a, hit, in a attack is 
do base pose, then you go to anticipation. And basically, like, an action game, the more time that's in the anticipation, the more time that the player has to do something about the attack or to avoid it or to hit the, the character. So a lot of your gameplay comes into the timing here. The faster that the, the attack happens, the harder it is to avoid it, and the, the harder your game ends up being. So it just depends on what you're, you're looking for in terms of game difficulty. But for now, this other thing, too, is we can still change the overall speed in Unreal um, if we need to. So let's just stretch this out. He's jumping high. So he's going to go up, and then we're going to do a, a connection pose. And again, it doesn't really matter where I do it in the animation timeline, because we can move those frames around later. I'm really just trying to get the feel from going pose to pose. So here he's going, he's stretched out, and we're going to basically have him do a full extension as he comes down to, to slam into you. We're going to have the head kind of lead that. Oops. So the head's going to go kind of first. Really want to extend him out and make him feel threatening there. And then his feet are going to do a cute little kind of turn where they kind of like pop up like this. And again, if we did a more complicated rig for this, we might have his mouth open and closed too, like he's trying to bite you here. He's going from base to anticipation to extension. I even move him out a little bit here. In my game, he'll have a big sphere that's going to be the attack collision, and that's going to show he'll be attached to his, his root or his head or somewhere. And it'll basically, that's where it's going to hit you. So the more extension you can give him, the better. And then the last pose you have is what's called recovery or follow through. This is another thing that's good for gameplay and also for selling the animation. So I've anticipated the attack, shown like how he's basically building up energy by jumping up. He's flipping forward, and then he'll land and has to recover. So right now I'm just kind of having him go back to here. I could have him do an actual landing where he kind of almost face plants a little bit because he threw himself so hard. If you give your character a lot of time to recover, it means that in the gameplay, if he already hit you, then he can't hit you again for a little while, which is good. And then if he missed you, then it gives you a chance to attack him. So that's just another gameplay consideration. All right, so I'm going to save. I'm going to show you what this all looks like from start to finish. So we, in this tutorial... We quickly made a basic skeleton for this guy, which just has bones going from the root to the stem to the head, eyes, brows, and the feet. We did rigid binding to attach the pieces of geometry to the skeleton. Each piece of geometry is only controlled by one joint, which makes it easy to do animation and skinning, but this removes some of the fidelity, but it's fine for this character. And then we animated the character. And we started with an idle. So that idle is uh, from 0 to 60. Then we did a walk cycle. Then we did a squash. Then we did a hit react. And then we did an attack. So this is what it kind of all looks like if you play all of them together. In Unreal, we're going to break these animations apart and then hook them up to our NPC characters. I see. And you could have done this in separate files if you wanted the animations, as opposed to all in one. Exactly. The other thing you can do is, you know, we're going to export it all as one, but you also can set rate frame ranges. So you can say, hey, I only want to export to another FBX just the idle and animation. you can name it that animation, right? Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yep. But both Unreal and Unity have ways to kind of take one animation, and when you import it, to pick which frames you want to use. So it really just depends on how you want to act. And if you've got, if you have a bunch of animators working on different animations, it can be helpful to have them in different files. So they can work on different files at the same time. But that's basically everything we need to have an animated a moving character uh, from our, our, and then this mesh, again, this is straight from Oculus Medium. So we didn't do anything special to this mesh. That's very cool. So for part three, which we're going to do next, we're going to start from here, export it, and bring it into Unreal, and then finish the uh, animation in the game there. John, thank you so much. This was really amazing, man. Good stuff. Cool. Thanks for having me, and I'm excited for part three, and keep making good VR. Definitely, man. And so if people want to get a hold of you, what should they do? You can tweet me at, at Bernhelm, that's B-E-R-N-H-E-L-M, and you can check out the game I'm working on. It's called Rubound, 
at rebound.com, R-O-O-B-O-U-N-D.com. Also, John, you'll be sharing the files, right? Correct. Yeah, we'll save out the Maya LT file as well as this file as an FBX. So you'll be able to see how my finished version went and looks kind of like what yours is like. To get it, though, you'll have to register for free at howtocreatevr.com. Without registration, you're not going to be able to download the actual assets. So, John, thank you so much. And to the rest of you, I'm glad you were here with us. Just a quick reminder, if you want more video tutorials just like this one, Assets to Practice With, podcast interviews, plus much more, make sure you register for free at howtocreatevr.com. Also, if you are ever in the Southern California area, we have a monthly meetup with lots of great VR, AR, and MR presentations. You can join or RSVP for our next meetup at howtocreatevr.com meetup. So until the next episode, I'm Marcelo Lewin. Cheers, everyone.